I'm going to open tonight actually by reading a passage from Isaiah. In community Bible study this year, we are studying the whole book of Isaiah, every chapter from beginning to end. And um, I heard there is somebody who sort of does doom and gloom for you, and I don't want to come here tonight and do doom and gloom, but if you're familiar with Isaiah, it is pretty heavy subject matter. But um, we're now in chapter 10, and it just made sense to to do a talk with a passage um, in some chapters. Okay, we'll just do it, that I've become very um, familiar with. So there, uh, in chapter five, there is an illustration that Isaiah gives, and it pretty much sums up all of chapters one through five, and really the entire book of Isaiah. So I'm gonna start with that. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard that I have not done for it. When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. I don't work the land. Uh, I, I strictly, um, meaning I don't garden, I find it a lot of hard work. But I do understand that planting a vineyard takes a great deal of preparation and care. In Isaiah's day, you would get a plot of land, and in the first year, you would remove all of the, the local plants that are growing in it, all of the weeds and that sort of thing. And then you would have to remove endless, endless numbers of rocks that are just scattered throughout the hillside and on the terraces. That's year one. In year two, the vineyard owner would go and buy the, the best plants that he could afford, the healthiest, the ones that are gonna grow the best grapes. And he would plant the grapes, and while they're growing in that year, he would take all of those rocks that he removed from the ground, and he would uh, make a watchtower from which he could look for safety, to look for two-footed enemies and four-footed enemies. And then he would build, with the remaining rocks, a big wall to protect his vineyard. And it's not until year three that you might actually get your first harvest. So as Isaiah is saying this, the listeners of his day, the people of Judah and Israel, are thinking, wow, this is a really great vineyard, early, um, vineyard owner. Then he goes on to say, though, that he didn't get good grapes. He gets wild grapes. And so as a result, the vineyard owner goes, I'm going to take away the watchtower. I'm going to remove the hedge, all the safety. I'm going to pray that rain doesn't come. And you can imagine the hearers in Isaiah's day are going, yes, Isaiah, we are with you. That is exactly what the vineyard owner should do because it's not worth his time and effort. He's given so much care. He didn't get what he expected. The vineyard owner should move on to better soil. Well, what they didn't know at the time, the whole time they're shaking their heads saying, yes, Isaiah, remove the vineyard, is that it was just an illustration that the vineyard is actually Israel and it's actually Judah. The whole time they're shaking their heads, they're actually condemning their selves. And, and the reason Isaiah, really, it's the Lord, is so upset with the, with the house of Israel and Judah, by this time, remember, Israel used to be one nation, but over, over the years it divided. So there's one, the northern kingdom is called Israel, and the southern kingdom is called Judah. So that's why we've got Israel and Judah. But it's, it's all of, of God's people. And, and God is really upset with them. And he gives, in these five chapters, and, and really throughout the book of Isaiah, he lists really a, a number of things over and over again that he's especially upset with. Um, some of God's accusations are greed. 
He says, you keep going after bigger houses and more land. And, and in God's um, provision for Israel, land was never meant to be owned by the people. God owned the land. And it was given to various families. Every tribe got land to work, except for the Levites, the priests, who, who were given offerings to sustain them. And the idea was by not owning the land and by recognizing that God owned it, was you look to God for your provision. So, and in addition to, to having the land be like that, is it also provided uh, a means of, of self-worth for everybody in the land. Every family had land. It put them on an even playing field, so to speak. And then finally, of course, every person had a way to support themselves. So what happened when these people, the rich people, were buying up more and more land? Well, first of all, they weren't supposed to even be buying it. But eventually, they squeezed the former owners out. And what used to be land that you own now became land that you were basically a servant on. So a very bad situation, greed. He talks about self-indulgence and the pursuit of pleasure rather than the pursuit of God's ministry. He talks about cynicism, and really in, when he talks about that, he's talking about taunting God. A certain segment of the people are going, you know what? I think if God were really unhappy with me, he would have let me know it by now. He would have taken away my blessings, right? I would have lost my children. I wouldn't be prospering in business. So bring it on, God, right? If you're really that unhappy with me, you know, let, let me see it. He talked about moral perversion, and there's a section where right becomes wrong, and wrong becomes right. Because when you no longer accept God's commandments and God's laws and God's ways, you start making up your own. And it's, it's, it's a really easy switch from going, I'm not just going to not accept some of God's law, now I'm just going to make up my own law. Talks about social injustice quite a bit, not defending the widows and the orphans, making up a lot of laws that favor the rich over the poor. He talks about the adulation of great men. Again, when people stop trusting in God, they're going to put somebody else on the throne of their life. And often it was their leaders. It could be the priest. It could be a prophet, um, somebody of great influence. And, they, and you know, this was the person that was going to you know, be the one who, who you know, runs the army and keeps us safe or whatever. Well, you know what happens when you put people on a pedestal? They fall. Because nobody is ever going to live up to all of your expectations. You should never put a human being, even, even a good moral human being, should never be put up on that level. Um, you're setting them up for failure. We talked a lot about arrogance, the attitude that we could take care of ourselves. We don't really need God. Well, maybe we need God a little bit. Right? But really, for the most part, we can take care of ourselves. We don't need God. And, and then I think among other things, but the last big one was the lack of brotherly love. He's talking about when hard times come, people have a tendency to look after themselves. It's every man for himself, even if it's brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor. Well, that's a pretty long list, and one of the reasons I said is I think Isaiah is so applicable is we see these things today. You see greed, moral perversion, social injustice, every, everything on the list is just as prevalent today as it was in them. Now keep in mind the audience that Isaiah is talking to are not pagans. He's talking to people in the house of Israel and Jacob, meaning he's talking to people who belong to the family of God. Right? These are people who are part of the covenant, people who have his word, who have experienced his miracles, who have this long, wonderful, vibrant history with God. So um, that's why I'm talking about it not, in judgment not being God's intended last word, because when judgment comes upon a believing person, um, it's always meant for the person of purification. It's not meant to destroy them. So Isaiah is saying, I'm giving you a warning, and here's the warning. Do not let yourself have a false sense of security. You can't think, Jews, just because you're in the family of God, God's chosen people, that when trouble comes, you're going to be safe. You have to have true faith. And a remnant is going to survive the coming judgment, but individuals are going to perish. Only a few will survive God's refining fire. And, and, and Isaiah tells us why. He says, you're sinning against the Holy One. I know probably all of you are familiar with the, the passage in Isaiah because it's about his call. So if you've ever 
in your whole life heard any passages on how God's people, one of the famous passages, Isaiah 6, right, where he says, in the year of King Uzziah, I saw a vision. And the vision is, you know, God seated on the throne. And just the hem of his garment fills the whole temple with his glory. And there's these seraphs flying around, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And what does Isaiah do when he has that vision? He says, woe is me. He thinks he's going to die. He has just seen the Holy One. And when he sees the Holy One, he is so struck by his, so, his, his own sinfulness, he thinks, surely I'm not going to be able to walk away from this experience. And he doesn't even think to ask God for forgiveness or to ask God for mercy because he knows he's not deserving of it. But of course, God's intended last word is not judgment. It is salvation. And, and so he gets his burning coal and he brings it up to Isaiah's lips and he burns it and Isaiah is, is, um, is, is cleansed and he's redeemed. And his response to God's call is, you know, who can I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. And that's what happens when you have a personal encounter with the holy God. And, and that's why Isaiah is so stern in his warnings to Israel. He's saying, you've sinned against the Holy One. There's only one God. This took a great deal of courage, even in Isaiah's day, because every other religion in the land was a pagan religion. And to say that there's only one God took just as much courage then as it says today, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not an easy message to tell at work, is it? Unless, of course, you work at a church or something. But for most of us, it's not a very popular message. And it wasn't a popular message in Isaiah's time. So the Holy One is the sole creator. He's saying, fellow members of God's family, God is the sole creator. And as a sole creator, God gets to set up the boundaries. He gets to set the rules. He knows the way the universe is supposed to exist, right? That's, that's just goes with God's territory. And he also says he's the covenant Lord, and he has committed himself to us. And that means God in turn is saying, I want you to commit yourself to me. It goes both ways, this relationship. He says he's the heavenly father, and that means we are not just objects to God. We are not just subjects to God. We are his children whom he loves and cares for. We're the vineyard that he's planted and cultivated. He loves us. He cares for us. All those boundaries he set up are for our good. And finally, um, he, he, he talks about, um, yeah, I think I've said, the Holy One, the sole creator, the covenant Lord, and the heavenly Father. That's why these charges are so so very serious. It starts with God and what God has done. And he's saying to the people, if you don't get that right, you don't have any foundation to start with. Okay? So we've got this holy God and this soul creator and this heavenly father and a covenant Lord. And he's saying, when you reject all of this, when you say you don't belong to God, that you essentially belong to yourself, you're going to start suddenly.